Wanted. Ambitious individual for leadership position. Be prepared for difficult application process and stressful work environment. Challenges, many. Rewards, numerous. Failure, possible. Your employer, the American people. The few chosen have been the presidents. On January 20th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated for an unprecedented fourth presidential term. For the past 12 years, he had successfully guided the nation through the Great Depression and was in the midst of leading it toward victory in World War II. For many Americans, he was the only president they had ever known. But unbeknownst to the public, he was in failing health. On April 12, 1945, FDR's third vice president in four terms, Harry S. Truman, received an urgent call. Only three months into his new job, Truman was asked to come quickly, but quietly, to the White House. Waiting for him was not FDR, but the First Lady. Harry, she said, the president is dead. Stunned, Truman responded, is there anything we can do for you? No, Eleanor replied, is there anything we can do for you? You're the one in trouble now. Number 33, Harry S. Truman, Democrat, 1945 to 1953, 60 years old, from Missouri. If Truman was astonished to learn that he had suddenly become President of the United States, the world was stunned. It was quite a shock. Americans, the world, sort of held their breath to see what Truman would do. He was really not that much of a national or worldly figure. So people were appalled. Everybody said, oh, who is this man Truman? Woe is the nation. Because we've got this ignoramus from Missouri who doesn't know anything about the world. And on and on and on. Well, he fooled them. Truman had led an average, undistinguished life until getting involved in politics at age 50. Before then, he'd been a farmer and a businessman. Harry Truman was a failed haberdasher from uh, Kansas City, Missouri in some ways. But he was plain spoken, he was blunt, he was a good leader, and he had common sense. And it shows that it's not depth of knowledge, but that good basic common sense that's so important to the American presidency. Truman was not one to mince words. He's called peppery. Some might say dyspeptic, some might say occasionally profane, uh, certainly plain spoken. He called a spade a spade and sometimes worse than a spade. <laughs> well, during my lifetime, uh, Harry Truman was my favorite. I admired him very much. I admired his honesty, his down-to-earth kind of approach to government. His willingness to make politically controversial decisions if he thought they were right no matter how much it cost him in popular support. One such decision confronted him almost immediately. After taking the oath, Truman was told for the first time about the Manhattan Project. This new president now faced the most consequential decision a president or any leader has ever had to make. The choice of dropping the first atomic bomb. On May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered. The war in the European theater was over. Yet the U.S. was still preparing for what looked to be a costly invasion of Japan. The estimates were any place from a million to 500,000 casualties if you invaded Japan and you had this weapon. And I think this was a clear-cut decision and old Harry Truman's Missouri common sense just came through. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. On August 15, 1945, the Japanese surrendered. World War II was over. Truman's initial decisiveness would come to define his presidency. He believed that it was important both for his own political credibility and also for the position of the United States, this critical moment at the end of the war, to make decisions and stick with it. He did adopt the motto that the buck stopped here, meaning the desk of the president. And that was something that a lot of people came to admire. 
Although the war had ended, a new struggle was beginning. The United States versus the USSR. Capitalism versus communism. He gathers what we call the wise men, these great titans of foreign policy, to come help him figure out how to deal with the Soviet Union. It was Harry Truman, George Marshall, and Dean Acheson who devised communist containment, the idea of containing the spread of communism, not trying to eliminate it militarily, uh, waging a war of ideas in the confident belief that over time capitalism would prevail and Western democracy. The policy of containment came to be known as the Truman Doctrine. It asserted America's right to support any nation in its struggle to fend off communist aggression. To rebuild war-ravaged Western Europe, thought to be vulnerable to the communist threat, Truman put forward the Marshall Plan. The United States government spent upwards of 12 to 14 billion dollars in the reconstruction of Europe. And nearly everybody, historians, political scientists, contemporaries, judge the Marshall Plan a resounding success. By advancing the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, and NATO, Truman hoped America would serve as a role model of democracy for the world. Yet while promoting equality and fighting poverty abroad, Truman faced inequality at home. He understood the hypocrisy between having just fought a war, ostensibly, against racism, and yet racism uh, embedded in every aspect of American life. There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry, or religion, or race, or color. In January 1948, Truman boldly ended segregation in the armed forces and the civil service by executive order. The modern civil rights revolution, as far as the presidency is concerned, really begins with Harry Truman. Truman's civil rights initiative was courageous, yet controversial. Furthermore, it appeared to be an act of political suicide. 1948 was an election year. Compounding Truman's troubles was an inflationary economy and an unprecedented number of labor strikes. Truman's popularity at the beginning of 1948 was about as low as any sitting chief executive had been, certainly any executive who had any hopes or any desire to be re-elected. So Truman was written off. Truman, however, campaigned fiercely. He crisscrossed the nation in a landmark whistle-stop tour, traveling 30,000 miles and giving 271 speeches. By contrast, his Republican challenger, Thomas Dewey, seemed to expect the presidency rather than campaign for it. He gave only 16 speeches. In a genuine surprise, Truman carried the popular and electoral vote, but the elation of his upset victory would soon be replaced by unyielding misery in his second term. First was the loss of America's former wartime ally, China, to communism. He was caught. He had been talking about the need to contain communism. Containment had failed in China, and it was inevitable that he was going to have to accept the blame. The Chinese Revolution, followed by the Soviets' entree into atomic weaponry, created hysteria on the American home front. Truman's administration was attacked by Senator Joe McCarthy for being soft on communism. When, six months later, North Korean communists invade South Korea. Truman, from a political standpoint, had almost no alternative but to say that the United States was going to go to the defense of non-communist South Korea. The Korean War was unlike any other. Despite some early successes, it turned into a stalemate when China threw its numerical might behind North Korea. There were other problems in the region specifically the escalating crisis for control of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh, the founder of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the Communist North, asked Truman for assistance in his fight for freedom from French colonialism. France, in turn, asked Truman to support them in their fight against the Communists in Hanoi. It became a priority of his administration to prevent the French from being defeated by communist forces in Southeast Asia. This was the beginning of America's involvement in the Vietnam War. 
By the end of his second term, nothing seemed to be going right for Truman. He was tarnished by the ongoing Korean War, the loss of China to communism, and disclosures of corruption in many agencies of the executive branch. Truman's popularity sank to an all-time low. When Truman left office at the beginning of 1953, he himself probably thought that he couldn't have been elected dog catcher, even in his hometown of independence. It would be decades before Truman would be appreciated for his adept conclusion of the Second World War, the highly successful Marshall Plan, and the first bold steps to end racial segregation. He went out of office with a very low popularity rating. I think it was about 23 percent. But as people assessed what he had done in office, now he's become one of the most admired presidents of all time. Harry Truman was so nearsighted that in order to enlist during World War I, he had to cheat by memorizing the Army's eye exam chart. 